would say the legend of central bank omnipotence, the one started by Alan Greenspan, which is being called into question more and more every day. At any rate, we'll do that in a second. Uh, I thank you all for attending. As I said, if anyone has any questions or comments or anything else that they would like to participate with the uh, in the webinar, please just type them into the chat and I'll be glad to respond. As you've all heard before I looked, I like to conduct these more as a colloquium than as a lecture. So we have in front of us the most extraordinary emphasis, the most extraordinary experiment in central bank policy. I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to call it an experiment in financial engineering. Financial engineering, of course, is the idea that was prevalent, and it's still around, I guess, where you can engineer. It's an interesting word, use of the word, engineering. What do engineers do? Well, they solve problems. They solve problems in the physical world. You want to put up a bridge? You need to know the tensile strengths of the materials. You need to know the distance. You need to know the weight. You need to know myriad factors. And you have to get the calculations right. We've all seen, I'm sure, on occasion, those uh, the collapse of that famous bridge in the Tacoma Sound in, Wa in uh, Washington, the United States, in the 19 1950s, I think. Um, the bridge had been built and did not properly take into account uh, it was a suspension bridge, the effect of wind on the span. And at certain speeds of wind, it made the bridge oscillate, made the roadway go up and down. Well, at some point, the bridge fell down. Engineering, it matters that you get it right. The analogy to finance is, at best, imprecise. The most recent example, which came a cropper, of course, um, in the financial crisis, was the idea that engineering can, in financial instruments, can, can that the proper construction of a financial instrument is akin to the engineering of a bridge. If you divide up the risks properly, hedging them in various markets. You can eliminate risk. The idea that the world is this manipulable, the financial world, is a very seductive idea, and it's one based in technology and the rather astonishing, if you think about it, um, advance of human technology in the past 150 years. But most of the technological advances are dealing with, shall we say, the hard sciences. They're dealing with reactions in the real world. Financial markets do not do that. Financial markets are human constructs. There is no Newtonian analysis in the financial markets. So you cannot use the analogy, or the analogy is incorrect. So you cannot build a financial instrument that will, given certain circumstances, always perform the same. You can do that in the physical world. If you build a bridge with certain strength, and every single time the bridge is asked to maintain its structure, underneath its load limit, it will do so. Because the physical world doesn't change. The force of gravity doesn't change. 
the force that cars going over a bridge um, stress the bridge doesn't change. But that's not true of the financial markets. And that's one of the problems that is the, the chief problem with the idea of financial engineering. The assumptions, the world of finance does change. And I don't mean that we now have electronic banking. I mean that the basis of these types of instruments are financial markets. And financial markets are, which we all need to remember all the time, human-based. And they react, of course, with panic and with elation and with euphoria and with fear. And they do not respond always on the basis of equations. So this idea of financial engineering, which brought the markets a cropper in 2008, has its I has as an intellectual basis much in common with the idea that central banks, because they're they are wise, because they are skilled, because they are knowledgeable, can also control economies and financial markets. And we are discovering, although it should always have been obvious, that this cannot be, that the, it will not be, that the world is not, the human world is not predictable. It is not governed by a set of laws and axioms that within constraints are always true and always accurate and always able to predict the reaction. This, and there's no other way to put it, but this hubris on the part of central bankers now is really the basis of today's topic. And it is interesting that the idea of uh, the omnipotent central bank. You know, psychologically, I think human culture wants to believe in things. It wants to find authority figures that will smooth the bumpy road of existence. But there really aren't any. Most institutions all institutions are made up of fallible people with fallible ideas, with interests that do not necessarily coincide with the amount of knowledge or expertise ascribed to them. And central bankers are certainly part of this, but it is true in time that the idea of financial engineering as a way to eliminate risk grew up about the same time, in the early days anyway, as the idea certainly started under Alan Greenspan, who's still with us, that central banks could smooth out the business cycle and keep the economy growing at a steady if unremarkable and non-inflationary rate. It was and is comfortable for markets in particular to believe in such a thing because it makes everybody's life so much easier. If the, we're going to grow at 3% and the stock market's always going to grow up, you know what the bond market's going to do and everybody can get wealthy over time and nobody has to worry about crashes or depressions or even recessions.
If ever there was an event which should have eliminated this rather blind faith in central bankers, it was and is characterized by uh, the Fed's response to the subprime crisis. You've heard this from me before, but it is, I think, key, the Fed and the ECB's response to the subprime crisis of uh, faulty mortgages and all of the uh, securitized products built on them uh, leading up to the financial crisis in 2008. The Fed's response, voiced by Mr. Bernanke, but in fact, I'm sure it was his opinion as well, that the subprime crisis, subprime problem in the United States was contained. It would not affect the economy. It was simply limited to some actors in the financial markets. And even when it started rolling in the United States, and Mr. Bernanke had clearly changed his mind because he sent the Fed funds rate plunging, even after that, in the summer of 2008, Jean-Claude Trichet said, what problem? We have no problem here. Just before, of course, the crisis fully took hold. If the Fed, the omnipotent central bank, was unable to fulfill, the Fed, a central bank has two, in its classical sense, two roles. The lender of last resort, it's really one role, that's it actually. But also, as part of that, to be knowledgeable about the risks going through the, central, the financial system. There is no greater illustration of the inability of even the best and the best, the wisest, the smartest, the best educated, and the best intentioned. I am not criticizing intent. Bureaucrats to ascertain what is going on than the Fed's response to that crisis. Clearly, the Fed had no clue as to what was happening in the financial markets. No ability to assess the actual risk whatsoever. This is a very important point because the same inability to assess risk, the same tools are used to justify the policies that have been followed since the financial crash. And they are uniform around the world. Led by the United States, we have the ECB and the Bank of Japan. Now, the reason I have the Bank of Japan up here is because in various guises, the central bank in Japan has been trying these policies for more than 20 years. What you're looking at is a CPI. Let's give them a better one. That's Japan's CPI. Let me give you the other one. This GDP. This is Japanese GDP. Unfortunately, these particular series don't go back as far as I want them to. But this is Japanese uh, GDP annualized the same way they do in the United States. And the basic Japanese overnight call rate, this is called. Is there any further proof required, really? Not as the title of this webinar is, are the central banks losing control. The true title should have been the central banks never had control. The ability to manipulate economies is and always has been far less 
prevalent, they have far less ability than they ever imagined. The long history, uh, let's take a look how far back can I get this one? Uh, let's see if I have a 30, I'm looking for a 30 year on Fed funds on farm payrolls. I'm just looking for CPI, PCE. Okay, this is PCE 30 years. It's US, um, the Fed's inflation, personal consumption expenditure price index, Fed funds rate and both uh, Fed funds rate and PCE, both core and non-core uh, over the past 30 years. The key has been the success of the central banks after the inflation of the 60s and 70s into the early 80s in reducing inflation. But I think that the success of that, and inflation went down. Remember, inflation was the scourge of the economy, certainly in the United States and elsewhere, in the 60s and the 70s. I remember my parents talking about it very well. Um, wages did not keep up with inflation. There seemed to be no controlling it. Um, at one point it reached 12%, I believe, in the United States. And the success of that campaign brought on a sense of accomplishment, I think, in the central banks. And the idea, and Alan Greenspan is the epitome of this, that central bankers do have the ability to manipulate economies. I think what's interesting is that in a normal economy where people are reacting as they normally do and their judgments are not warped or affected by artificial developments, then central banks do have a certain degree of ability to dial up or dial down the sense of the economy. The, the movement of money and uh, equipment and goods and production through an economy. Cyclically, that counter-cyclically is the classic extension of central bank, counter-cyclical economic policy, is the classic extension of the more restricted classical role of a central bank as the lender of last resort and the protector of the financial system. But that ability is far more circumscribed. The ability only functions within certain financial and economic parameters. Put it this way, another way. The basic idea behind countercyclical central bank policy is that interest rates can affect decision making in the economy. And that's true. But two things are also true. One, they only affect economic activity at the margins. And two, they cannot create demand. Remember, in any economy, this goes back to Adam Smith and probably back to the ancient Greeks, the demand, the activity, is controlled by the supply and demand for any particular item, be that money, be that pens, be that hairbands, or whatever. 
neither side is wholly or even mostly controllable through interest rates. If I need a hairband for whatever reason, if you can see my picture, you can see that's clearly not true, but at one time it was, then that is something that I have a need for. I will buy it because I need one. I need to keep a hair on my ass. If I have the demand, then somebody will go out there and make it. But if the price is a dollar or $10, or I need to borrow the money to finance it, what will happen is that the demand doesn't change. I still need that hairband. But I may, may buy two if the price is low, and I may delay a price purchase if the price is high. The same with money. You may go out and buy a house, but the demand, the need for a house is only for a very small portion of people determined by the interest rate. Now, if you if sometime like in the 80s, when Volcker was head of the Fed and jacked rates up very high, it would affect a greater number of people. But it didn't create or squelch the demand. And this is the key fallacy in interest rate policy when the problem is lack of demand. But you see, the interesting thing when you say, as the Keynesians all do, the problem is lack of demand, that's not a sufficiently deep analysis. One needs to ask the following question. And so the Keynesians answer to this is, well, you just create artificial demand filling up the proverbial hole. But that doesn't work. You need to answer, a certain situation right now, you need to ask the next question. The next question, why is there a lack of demand? Or is there simply too much supply? So the demand hasn't changed all that much, but now there's a great deal of more supply, and why is that the case? And these questions are not asked in response and not asked by the central bankers, apparently, in response to their policies. So here, let us go back to the role and what it is we're trying to accomplish here, what the central bank is trying to accomplish here. They're trying to, and you know, I started this with the, uh, I started thinking about it actually, with the Bank of Japan and their um, supposed change in the interest rate target. And what does that mean? Now, of course, the central bank, the Bank of Japan and Kuroda, resent it as simply a minor adjustment in policy. It's just trying to get interest rates to 2%. Um, I think that's complete nonsense, but I understand why they would say it. What it is, is a policy failure. And they know it. They can't do it. If there's anything that's evident right now, it's that interest rate policy, by whatever means, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it, browning purchase, can't create either demand or inflation or economic growth. It doesn't matter if you don't have a sufficient economic theory to explain why that's true. What does matter is that you accept the empirical evidence that this is the case. So far, almost everyone in the public life at any rate is, is unable or unwilling to accept the evidence. So this is, um, wait a minute, this is, uh, this is US PCE and uh, of both types. Let's look at GDP. 
Okay, hang on. Fed funds, GDP, 1970. Here we go. This is Fed funds, GDP, 1970. Back to 1970. It's as far as I can. Remember, the basic, the basic role of central banks, the lender of last lord, protect the financial system. The new modern, or more modern, post-1960s is make the economy stable and grow. Well, most of the decisions that affect economic growth in an economy are only affected by interest rates at the margins. They do not get to the core issues. So look at this. This is Fed funds in yellow, GDP in white, you American, and the uh, yearly uh, moving average. This is a quarterly chart, so you have four quarters on the uh, orange, the uh, purple line. If, and everyone has heard this argument, but no one wants to approach it, if interest rates at zero, or effectively at zero, were capable of sponsoring interest rates, I mean, you know, this, this is, it always amazes me that the basics of the argument, the, the, the very, very basic logical approach without knowing any economics. If interest rates at zero could foster, sponsor, cause steady, non-inflationary economic growth, why don't we all live in an economic utopia? Why don't we just do that? Exit rates at zero forever and everything will be fine. This is the basic question which never seems to get asked. So we have proof of it, of course, now. Now that we've tried it, then experience is always the best teacher, that there is almost no relation outside of the normal, outside of normal economic activity. There's almost no relation. Now, if we look here at this end of the chart here, we're discovering that perhaps there is a relation and it's negative. So let's take it back further one step. Let's start with Japan and then we will move on to the rest of the countries. Okay, because this is the longest, uh, longest run I've got here. I think it's very specifically in Japan. Japan has been trying to get to 2% inflation rate. I, you know, and I've said this many times before, but I'll say it again. Um, there is almost no evidence, empirical evidence, even theoretical evidence, that I'm, that I'm aware of. And I'm not an academic, as you know that. I'm, uh, my background is in currency trading in the 90s up until about 2000 for about 12 years, um, that 2% inflation is a benefit, sponsors growth, helps economies expand, or does anything else except write down debt. If you look at a historic, and I mean um, an inflation chart going back, I don't know, three, four hundred years. What you'll find, largely, is that for long, long periods, prices were essentially stable. I mean, the Japanese have, I think, rice prices going back a thousand years, maybe. In England, there are corn rec records of corn prices going back at least, I think, to the 17th century. So you'll find that for very long periods, prices simply didn't vary very much. And when there was inflation, it was almost, almost always because the government, kings or otherwise, 
started debasing the currencies. A steady diet of inflation is a creation of central banks, by and large. Not completely, but by and large. And here you have the empirical knowledge, which I think is misconstrued. Because the world economies, you know, as, as industrialization advanced, is coincident with the advent of a relatively steady inflation, punctuated by uh, occasional periods, mostly uh, nationally based periods of virulent inflation, that one is necessary for the other. That inflation is necessary for a uh, relatively rapid degree of modern economic growth. I don't believe that. I don't really think there's any, any proof or at least theoretical basis for this idea, be that as it may. The Fed has declared, along with many other central banks, that they want inflation to be 2%. I mean, if I were an am a consumer, I would say, well, why? But aside from that, long before the BOJ and the Fed and everybody else started espousing specific inflation targets, the BOJ was attempting both to promote economic growth and inflation back more than 20 years. This chart is proof that it can't and doesn't. In order for inflation to take hold, this period right here, uh, the invention of Abenomics and uh, that 60% drop in the yen is the reason for that spike. Suddenly a lot of imported products in Japan, primarily uh, energy, became much more expensive and prices shot up. It had no permanent effect on the underlying inflation rate. Japan's problems are clearly not amenable to repair by interest rate manipulation. It would behoove all of us, starting here and going right around up to the people who run central banks, to realize that evidence is available, that modesty might get a good deal more accomplished than pretensions to omnipotence. Clearly, this does not work as a policy tool. Now we're going to look back at the GDP, and then we're going to move on to the US. The basis of all of this is we want GDP, we want the economies to grow, we want people to get wealthier, we don't want there to be too much inflation. This is back 20 years, but you know, that's only because I could only get this particular series on interest rates back 20 years. But as everybody can see, the lack of correlation is both striking and beyond question. So we're back to the, the question of supply and demand. Low interest rates do not create demand. They don't create demand for money. That would be inflation. And they don't create demand for goods. Within the bounds of normal a normal economy, 
they can have effect. But outside the bounds of a normal economy, which I think is where we are now, they do not. So what is perhaps the mechanism whereby this takes place? But first, let's go back to the U.S. and see what we can get for, uh, let's look at GDP first. Oh, we'll, we'll look at the EU as well, but these things are, uh, you know, they, they're uniform across economies. Okay, this is U.S. GDP. As I said earlier, the success of central banks in dealing with inflation, or at least they assumed it was their policy, which had some effect. You know what? I think it probably did. Um, they go on and on. I mean, central bankers, and I know the Fed loves this one about inflation expectations. Uh, for my mind, um, the idea of expectations in consumers is utterly pointless. Because anyone, including myself, is going to say, what do you think inflation is going to be in a, in a year? And my answer is going to only tell me what inflation is now. Nobody has a clue. The only people who have a clue, or at least are willing to, to stake something on it, are people in the credit markets. So if you want to know what inflation is going to look at, look at the credit markets. That's the best guess you're going to find anywhere. It's infinitely better than the Fed's own analysis. Or as I wrote a couple of weeks ago, um, the reason why the credit markets are not paying any attention to the Fed's pronouncements is very simple. For the past year, the Fed has been wrong and they've been right. Nothing that the Fed has said that would transpire in response to its policies, either its projections or its analysis, has been correct. The markets have been correct. The, Fed, the, the credit markets have written down, or at least have very low opinion, of any interest rate increases in the Fed, no matter what the Fed said, and the markets have been right. So let's look at the actual process. What low interest rates actually do to an economy? How they affect the decision process? Because jobs, income, demand are created elsewhere. They're facilitated elsewhere. They're mediated elsewhere in the economy than in the Fed's equations and the Fed's interest rate policy. So is it possible, and I think it is, that as the low interest rates are prolonged, they don't become counter-cyclical, counter they become, in a sense, until they're removed, structural. Because they are providing a signal. So what do they affect? Remember, I think I've spoken about this before, that the Fed, and I, I, it, it's easy to criticize, and so I understand that. And I, I'm trying not to be uh, overly critical of, 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 of Fed policy, but some things do kind of escape my understanding. When quantitative easing went through, and people, and, and the clear indication from the Fed was that there was a demand gap and that the Fed needed to create demand and that interest rate policy could do that by taking away the rewards for keeping money in a bank so people would automatically go out and spend it. That was the assumption. If people are not earning money in a bank, they're going to go out and spend it. We have now incontrovertible proof that that is not the way the economy works. Because one, it misunderstands why people save in the first place. People save because they expect to need the money in the future. They're not necessarily saving 
because they're getting interest. The purpose is to amass a certain amount of money for the future. And they may have to save a little less if there are interest rates. But what's the reverse of that? If they're getting paid interest, they may save a little less because they can say, well, I'll put in $100 and in 10 years I'll have $140 and therefore I can save a little bit less because I'm getting interest return. But what's the reverse of that? The reverse of that, of course, is that in 10 years, I still need $140, but I'm not getting any interest. So of course, what's the answer? The answer is to save more. So this very, very basic functionality of interest rates and their effect on the savings rate really did seem to have escaped our policymakers. And the exact result of this was precisely the opposite reaction. So the interest rate policy actually, as a zero rate, has the reverse effect on the economy as to what was both anticipated and hoped for. People did not go out and spend more money. They spent less. They saved more. The rate went up. And if people are saving more and spending less, what happens? The economy slows down. Okay, let's take the business side of this. You're going to put up a factory. You probably got a 10 year horizon on your plans. You have to borrow the money to put the factory up. Most businesses fund their things out of borrowed money. They don't have retained earnings to the degree necessary to expand like that. So yeah, it's a good thing now you can go out and get a very cheap loan. But many businesses have, they don't pay off their loans, like the government. They issue more debt or they roll the loan over into the future, into the future, into the future. That's certainly what the government does. Well, in order to run your budget in some sort of reasonable idea of whether you're going to be successful or not, you need to be able to estimate at some point the interest rate costs. It's dicey enough starting a new business. But if you have a relative range for your interest rate costs, you can make a reasonable projection as to how much your business is going to need to make to both operate and to fund its, its debt. If you don't think you can make that judgment, then what do you do? Well, you're far less likely to invest, to create the business, to create the jobs, to attempt to expand your business. Especially if you're answering to the demands of a public, of public ownership. An individual entrepreneur might be more willing to take that risk. Public corporations, under the scrutiny of the financial markets and all the other uh, forces judging and impacting on their behavior are far less likely. So the results of this low interest rate policy is reduced consumer spending and reduced business spending. And that's exactly what we've seen. You could, you could have said this in the beginning, almost nobody did when the Fed started QE and almost nobody did. But even if nobody, nobody appreciated it, at the time, the evidence is in front of us. It's true here, it was always true in Japan, and it's been true in the ECB. So the this very narrow approach through interest rates that the central banks use, because that's all they have, 
is one which is no longer providing any return on their policy investment. So let's take a further step back. Okay, let's let's think. If we see now that interest rate policy alone cannot create inflation. In the US, inflation, by some measures, inflation is picking up. But they don't have a lot to do with policy, with the Fed, but they have, well, let's look at this way. In the US, some inflation measures are picking up, driven by two things, primarily. Health costs are skyrocketing, again. And that is primarily due to the government into government force changes in the healthcare system in the United States. That's the primary reason. Housing costs have been rising at a very quick rate, a very fast rate. That also, I think, has a lot to do with the lack of actual investment in housing. New home rates are far, but new home construction rates are far below what they were um, before the crisis. And not only that, if you prorate them for population changes, they're much lower than they should be. So the turnover and the prices are much higher than they would be. Part of this is the chasing of assets. So let's look at that again. So we have from insurance, from, from low interest rates, we have a drag on consumer, a drag on business spending. What's the last aspect of this? It's of course the pursuit of yield. No, the next to the last aspect. So all the markets, including the housing market, including all assets, is probably false a false way of analysis. When you look at CPI, when you look at how at inflation rates, not to include analysis in the structure of many asset classes. I mean, they exclude stocks and things like that because they're financial markets. Um, housing is included to some degree. I don't believe uh, housing prices, rental and rental costs are included, but not housing prices as well. If you're not renting, you're buying. You gotta live somewhere, or you're living with your parents. You gotta live somewhere. And if you included the cost of housing, I mean, I think uh, last week I did a brief, uh, I did a, a short piece on, on housing and housing prices uh, for existing homes, 90% of the US housing market have risen at a in the past three years, three and a half years, at double, more than double the rate of wage increases. So what's going on there? Where's the pressure coming from? Some of the pressure is coming from asset pursuit. So interest rates, you have negative or negative effects on consumer spending, on business spending. You have asset inflation, and the last attribute of this policy, and it might have worked for a short amount of time, but the longer it goes on, the worse it gets, of course, is the inability to judge future costs in business investment. And what does that mean? This gets back to the idea of supply and demand for products. I said earlier, well, for any product, I think I used hair bands, there's a certain amount of demand which interacts with a certain amount of supply producing a price. Well, if demand drops, the prices are going to go down. But also true that if supply goes up with a relative, relatively the same demand, then prices will go down. And that's the result, or what you've seen, with this last aspect of zero rate policy. It has created all sorts of phony analysis 
in production. Best example, of course, is oil. Both prior to 2008 and then when oil in 2010 or 11, I don't have the, the chart in front of me, oil went back up to $100 a barrel. What happened? In both times, we had the advent of the US and Canadian and elsewhere shale fields. It was profitable to begin with. If you get $150 a barrel, you're making a lot of money from shale oil, even if your, your production costs are 75. And so they invested, the price came crashing off. And what did happen after that? The efficiencies almost inevitably inherent in capitalism started to take effect. So the shale oil producers that were producing initially at $75 now be producing at 40. Well, what does this mean? It means that there's a permanent pressure on energy prices. They're not going to go back up to $100 a barrel. Why? Because all of the shale oil producers, or many of them, are ready to start producing again when the price goes up. So you have an inherent cap on prices. And what's kind of the last thing, I might as well deal with them all here, that you get from low interest rates? Borrowing. Reduce the price of something, you get more of it. Borrowing. Government debt, private debt, everything except consumer debt, really. And what is that telling you? Businesses are buying, not to create production, but to buy back stock. What does that do? It sends the stock market up. Was that a bubble? Government doing. What are they doing? I don't know what they're doing with all their money. They're borrowing zillions. Well, technically the word's trillions. So from interest rates, you have all of these. Remember, the goal of low interest rates is to promote economic growth. That's the, that's the goal. Now, the Fed will say, of course, well, you know, it's also to prevent disaster. That's fine. And for a number of years after 2008, it was hard to argue with their analysis because they couldn't do anything else. They had to do something. Things did look pretty grim, so they did that. But all of the other effects, consumer spending, business spending, malinvestment, debt, conspire in an economy to reduce economic growth. Because none of them are really, on the investment side, are productive investments. So now, let's look at the immediate future. The Fed did not reduce, I mean, did not raise rates in September. I don't think anybody in creation thought they would. Although, interestingly enough, three members of the board thought they should. You can certainly make a good argument that they should. However, so the Fed is once again data dependent. They're data dependent. The only thing they're data dependent, data dependent about are the markets, frankly. Um, so we now have, it's now end of September. We have October, November, and December. Um, three more months, basically, of information. Forget the election. The recent data, the last um, Atlanta Fed GDP estimate, I think, for the second quarter, they're almost finished. I think there may be one more. It was down to 2.9. My guess is it comes in in the low twos when it actually comes out. So we will have three quarters. That will be fourth. You would have, I think it was, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.2, and then 2.5, let's say. How does that support a rate increase? It doesn't. Look at the ISM numbers. So there isn't going, there's nothing indicative in the economy now 
that is going to produce the types of statistics that can really justify the Fed raising rates. So is the Fed going to come out? Remember, the Fed is the leading proponent of this stuff. Is the Fed going to come out and then change their analysis? Give you basically the analysis that I've just given you. That we are at the point where interest rates at this level are doing far more harm than good. We need to provide, to let the economy have the ability to determine the price of money, because after all, that's what we're talking about, so that can make sensible decisions. Nothing's going to really revive until we think, until we return that. Is the Fed going to come out and make that change? The answer to my mind is absolutely not. They're going to continue to go on with this sort of false equivalence about, it's not really an equivalence, well, I would say an equivalence between interest rate policy and data. By any standard of policy analysis, the Fed's own criteria, we are long since at the point where the Fed should be normalizing rates, especially remembering that these are not rates down here as part of a business cycle, but as part of a response to an economic and financial crisis, which is no longer with us. Yet the Fed has hesitated and hesitated and hesitated. And I think that is telling you that even if they don't admit it, the Fed understands that monetary policy is one, no longer efficient, and two, economic policy is slipping out of their control. It is not simply my analysis, and I've been making this argument for some time. It is their actual actions that are telling you this. It is clear, I think, and the Bank of Japan, I think, has recognized this, that this policy has reached the end of its line. It's long since passed the do not buy date that you'll find on your cartons of milk. We will see, and I think this is going to be fascinating, both from a theoretical and a market point of view, how the central banks will extricate themselves from this policy. But extricate themselves, they will have to do because the increasing negative effects of these policies are empirically evident. Okay, everyone, I thank you very much for listening once again. This is gonna be the last uh, central bank policy analysis I do for a couple of weeks. I think it's been, given the circumstances, it was inevitable, but I think it's now uh, reached its limit, so to speak. Anyone has any comments, criticisms, or anything else, please send me an email. I'll be glad to respond. I will put the email up on the chat. Again, I thank you all very much for attending. I hope everyone has a great day. Take care.